I'm Michael Forney, and I am a designer at Microsoft Teams. I've helped design some of the platform surfaces that you're already using for extensibility, and I do a lot of work with customers and partners, um, hundreds of meetings uh, with customers and partners, helping them try, build, try to build their solution. So let's start off with how I actually do my job, and I want you to think about how you work with your customers and your partners, um, and, and really think about yourselves as kind of deputy designers in a way. The issue is, is that a lot of people are not building actually for teams. They're building one-on-one -on -one apps. And the problem that we run into with these one-on-one -on -one apps is they be, that's a big issue with discoverability. Um, it is very hard for us to share directly out of these one-on-one -on -one apps. And if you build for teams and you build on collaboration, what you're gonna find is you, you get the viral effect of one person does the configuration or one person starts sharing and everybody is aware of the application. So how we do that is with uh, collaboration and channels. Uh, tabs are certainly an excellent way of, of, it's a large surface to play with. Um, sharing, so message extensions, and we get a ton of leverage out of a message extension. We get link furling, we get, uh, the, we get access to it from the power, uh, from the command box. Um, we get access to it from our compose box in both in one-on-one -on -one and in channels as well. Another mechanism that we do recommend, but you have to be very careful, and I'll talk to you about proactivity, um, so is notifying people in channel and being very tactical about how you do that, using actionable messages, not just something like, uh, you know, something has happened and then you have to go off to the, off to the uh, entity to, to discover it. The last one is really, um, and I haven't seen a lot of apps, and I'm trying to get people to really think about this, is user customizable applications. So I get my information and my content the way that I want to, so uh, I don't have to adapt to the way that you thought I should, should interact. So remember that Teams is a hub, and we want to bring users and, and content together in one place. And if you build a one-on-one -on -one, uh, app, you are being an app hole, so don't be an app hole. So, Balmer used to say all the time, developers, 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 and I'm just going to tell you scenarios, scenarios, scenarios. The number of times that I've heard someone start the conversation off with, I'm going to build a bot. Uh, it, it's really sad because uh, that that is not a scenario that is not getting something done for your users. So really asking yourself, who is the hero that you're building for? And, and that can be very specific. Building something for a specific set of users is, is incredibly powerful because it allows you to sort of scope your, uh, scope your work down. And you'll be surprised that building something that's excellent with one person in mind or one role in mind will often have this kind of leapfrog effect that, you know, uh, and, and the, the example that I often give is the OXO Good Grips um, uh, can opener. The the guy that designed that designed it for his wife who had arthritis. And guess what? Everybody, it's easy for everybody to use. So, um, the tell telling the story and giving giving yourself an elevator pitch is really helps scope down what it is that you're trying to build. A lot of us will either scope something down so far that it's not terribly useful, or we'll scope up so huge that we end up with this thing that is kind of a beast and very difficult to build and deliver. So the, the term that I want you to really walk away with is minimum, is, is instead of minimum viable product, is minimum lovable product. Uh, a, a minimum viable product is a car with three wheels. I only have one in the front. We'll get that fourth wheel on there in the next version. And you can make a left turn throughout all of Bellevue and Redmond, but you know, to get back to where you're going, you're gonna have to just continue all the way around. Yeah, so you can get the, the scenario can be completed, but it's a real pain. And you, you have to recognize that users have very low tolerance for pain with, with applications, especially these kind of integrations that are inside of Teams. This should go without saying, but it's useful to just think about, is it solving a real problem? So. If you're making an app, if you have a scenario, is that is it solving a real problem for a team or are you just manufacturing something? So this is a, a place where you want to talk to customers and users uh, directly and not just the people who are making decisions. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of that in a, a little bit later. How often it's going to be used. I hear the I hear approval scenarios a lot. And if you think about the Microsoft organization, how many people 
actually do approvals. So as a mid-level manager, I generally don't do approvals. My next level manager does some. So when you're talking about these kinds of, and you know, how often am I doing it? I'm doing it maybe once a month, maybe. So that isn't even this daily usage scenario. Um, the how many people is it affecting? It's maybe 2%, 5% of the total population. So is it something that's an incredibly useful scenario? Definitely. Is it something that affects um, like a business decision maker? Definitely. But it's not going to provide a lot of daily usage and get a lot of eyes. And it may not actually, if you think about it, supply a lot of return on your investment. So this is actually how I do my job. Um, and I want to just pause for a second. How I organize this is I will get a conference room and, and I've done this with partners with their own customers. So uh, I've got a conference room. I've got two to three customers, actual users of their product or, or our product sitting right across from this whiteboard. And the first question I'm trying to answer. So we start off with, you know, what are the general scenarios that we want to try and solve? The first question that I, I, I want to answer is who's doing what? And on the left here, and I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. On the left here, um, what I'm really trying to get across is what is their motivation? What are they doing? And for instance, this is a legal discovery scenario that, that I mapped out. Often a partner is running multiple, so this is a, a lawyer, um, solicitor for those of you in the UK, that is running multiple, uh, multiple discovery cases uh, simultaneously. And that person is going to pick a set of people that are going to be on their team. Uh, and he'll have senior associates, junior associates, and even paralegals. And so what I want to understand is the motivation that's sitting behind those. Because the last thing you want to do when you're going through this flow is ignore what is you know, their final product. A good example of this was um, uh, I was working with a financial institution, and they were dealing with petabytes of financial data. And there's a lot of work to massage that financial data and turn it into a, a, um, a, a data cube that they can actually do a bunch of really, really detailed reports on. But their end product wasn't about the data cube. It was actually trying to tell a story. And so at the end of this, what they're trying to do is say, here's the story for what your mergers and acquisitions will look like. Here's the story for this managed services, services that we can actually provide you as you go through this process. And so if, you, if you're if you looking at that motivation as you're going through their process, that's uh, it's incredibly powerful and can help you make decisions in, in the long term. I do recommend during these uh, discussions, and so these discussions can last almost, you know, between four to six hours if you let it go, uh, have uh, somebody who's an SI, have somebody who's a developer, have somebody who's a project manager in the room so that we're all taking in this information at the same time. Yeah. And then the next thing I do is I go through step by step what actually is happening. So in this case, there's an intake form. And I, I actually ask the question, um, who is actually doing this? And it turns out in a multi uh, in, in, in a, a multi-million dollar company, they knew the per, who the person was. This was Holly was actually writing up this intake form. And it's interesting to me, this is like, so is this, where is this, is this something that's in an app? Is there something, is there an API that we can write? Is there, can we do this as a power, as a, uh, a power apps form that is actually then doing something to this, into this flow? Um, and then we step through every single step of the process. And what I'm trying not to get to is, what are the apps that they're using? I'm trying to understand what is the, what is happening in that process? What is what is the goal of each one of these steps? Because in some cases, we may actually say, I've got an app layer that is sitting on top of multiple apps. We may swap out the apps that are actually providing this data in between, because at the end of the day, what we're doing is going to push information and use Teams as a display mechanism, as a canvas for, for showing all the information in these other, other integrations. So as I go through this, I just one, two, three, four, five, and I'm and I double check, and we're doing this right with the customers. So they're telling me I'm I'm not having to do anything other than ask lots of questions. 
I'm acting like a three-year-old. I'm asking why until people start getting frustrated. Then I go back through this and identify, and these are the red marks. Is this something that is something that we can automate? Is it something that somebody is sending an email, which in my mind is the equivalent of pushing a button, and that is now a signal to the service that we can we could do something. So we go through it, and then I'll do one final pass. And it's like, okay, so here's what we're talking about. One, we do this. Two, three, four, five, six. This is just a verification of here's the flow that they expect to be able to do. And then the next step on this let's see if I can move it forward, is actually doing the design. And I'm going to design it right in front of them. And this is the tool that I use. So I do use, we do use Sketch. Uh, there are lots of designers that will use Figma. Um, you do not want to get a laptop in front of your, as a dividing line between you and your customers. And so doing this on a whiteboard is incredibly powerful. It helps you control the room. It also makes sure that everybody is paying attention. And it's a fast way to fail. Like ultimately, do I want to fail on a whiteboard or do I want to fail in code? And so I'm able to do iterations and get validation in front of the user that I would not be able to do as quickly. And so this, this is, in many ways, commando research and design simultaneously. It's, this is agile design, quite, quite literally. <laughs> Here's the deal. You can draw a box. This is literally what I do. Like, this is not fine art, guys. <laughs> so uh, I, will make one, uh, I will make one recommendation. It has become a drinking game. Uh, uh, when I do these presentations, uh, that I will create a box which will house a button, and then I will write a word which cannot fit in that box. So my, my one recommendation is don't draw the box until you write the word. Uh, otherwise, um, if you have a drinking game, everybody will be drunk and possibly happier at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the session. So, but here's the deal. Fail here or fail in code. I, I have seen actually situations where, and you actually... I'm going to say, you do want to encourage this. I've seen situations where I have two customers, two users, that are actually having a heated debate about the content of what is in this card. Is it actually enough for them to act on? And that's great. That's what you want. It's like, let them duke it out. Let them tell you what the design should be. That's the easiest way to do this. And so, again, this is something that you can actually do yourselves. I do it. Uh, it's very easy and comes naturally to me because I've been doing this for a long time. Um, but all you're going to do throughout this whole process is you're going to document one golden path. Don't worry about the uh, failure cases or the error cases unless they're critical to, they're absolutely critical to the workflow. All you want to do in this, this one case is document the golden path. Um, after you're done with this, and then you can do this on your own, is backtrack and cover error cases and that sort of thing. This is usually enough for us to get started uh, and do start doing some coding. Here's the other thing that's really super important about this. You get one first date. Um, I actually met my wife on uh, doing uh, 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 online dating, and I, I dated a lot of folks. And I, I'm going to just say, like, there are, there are some people that you meet, and they look good on paper. And that first date, it's just they're a zombie. They're going to eat your brain. I don't want to have a second date. That is absolutely the case with your app. Your first impression with these apps, it's mission critical that we talk about what the value proposition is, that there's good documentation, that the icon isn't awful. Um, and in some cases, you may actually want to either find a writer or hire a writer to, act, to, to backfill some of, and this, this, goes, this is equally true for a line of business apps if you're working with a customer who's trying to build a line of business app. Because I'll give you a really fantastic example of this. It's like, um, I'm the best bot in the world. Give me your Facebook password. Uh, it's just, you're, it's a dead stop. So with, those, with that notion of first date, there are lots of opportunities for us to upsell the app. And what you want to do is upsell the app and not the company. Um, what is the value I'm going to get out of this? So our new um, details views inside of the store, if you haven't seen these already, we're supporting uh, screenshots and video uh, and richer, richer, richer descriptions. So, you know, really lean in on this. What is the value that a user is going to be able to do? What is the story that you want to tell the user? 
after the app is actually installed, I love to see tours. So a one-on-one -on -one tour can be done like this in a, in a carousel on the right. Um, but if you're in a channel, which I do recommend you start with, uh, you can pop that up into a task module or a dialogue. And so now I'm able to see a private uh, viewing of really here's how to use the app, but also here's the value that the app is going to provide. All right, so that's how we get started with the design process. As we go through, what I'm gonna do next is go through all of the features and the, uh, the surfaces that we have and when to use them and how to use them. Do, does anyone have any questions before we go forward just in terms of this customer interaction and getting kind of the, the scenarios down in a way that makes sense? I will move forward. All right, so you're all using Teams. You understand that it is an immersive experience. We're bringing elements uh, of uh, other interactions directly into the into Teams. We have personal apps, tabs, conversations, instant notifications. Most of what we're going to talk about is going to show up or is already showing up on mobile right now. Um, bot framework, we're going to lean in really, really hard on because it's something that a lot of people will build, and I've seen most of them build them in ways that don't make any sense to users. Uh, message extensions, uh, we'll talk quite a bit about cards, uh, and let's just start off with tabs. So we all understand that tabs uh, are something that are, this is, in, in some ways, tabs can be the hardest and the easiest things to plug in. So if you have an existing website, yes, you can host this in a tab. What we are asking from a design perspective is deliver focused functionality. And in other words, don't put an entire portal in here. The second is, and that and that's really means reducing your crumbs. So for instance, uh, as you can see, we use tabs for navigation. So if your integration has tabs as well, now we've got like a tab sandwich, tab crepes, tab chapati, whatever you like to stack and eat. So um, it, it just, it creates a lot of problems uh, to have a bunch bunches of, notif of navigation inside of this. And so reducing that Chrome is incredibly useful. The other thing that is useful is making sure that this is responsive to our uh, themes. And that is, and for many of you, you're dealing with government agencies uh, or uh, companies that require some level of accessibility. To get the some of that accessibility, you need to be able to support our high contrast theme. And so, to be able to do that, there's a JavaScript that you can use to sniff for that uh, sniff for that theme, and that will also work with the dark theme that is uh, shipped that is shipped on uh, mobile as well. What the other fact uh, factor of these is, you know, what is really the conversation about on the tab? And this will help you minimize what's going into this. Let me give you an example of where not to go. So if I had a portal like MSN and uh, uh, I pinned it into this, and you could do this today, and I, oh, I see an article and that gets me to another article. I'm just navigating inside of this tab. And then finally I see, uh, hey, there's this great article on puppies and I, at mentioned my friend Dana, and I was like, hey, Dana, cool puppies are so cute, oh, great. And okay, so let's just stop for a second. That's a parameterized URL that is going to go to one place and one place only, msn.com, the homepage. So when Dana clicks on my response, she clicks on my at mention, she's gonna go to the root here, and all she's gonna see is something on, probably on Donald Trump, which is not as exciting as, you know, cute puppies. So when you have a bunch of navigation inside of that, you have this problem of what the conversation is about. So the, the other fact, factor on this is really allowing some personality, some of the brand that, that comes along for the ride. We usually encourage people to put that up in the header, um, but if you're using, uh, if they're using icons that are similar to ours, just use the ones that we already have. Um, it really helps with users when they're going from, let's say, our chat services and, and our UI into a completely different UI. There's a big contextual shift if the whole interaction pattern and, and the look and feel is radically, radically different. Single canvas, you've seen this. This is effectively like a Word document. Uh, columns, this is something like a uh, uh, planner. You know, the conversation on this is, you know, what are the work items? Where are we at within our workflow? We see lots and lots of lists. Um, my team is currently working on a project for building out 
um, templated component libraries. So really composites and list is the one that we see about 90% of the case. These are not trivial to design. Um, and this is the, you know, this is why I say tabs can be the easiest, but also the hardest. Our, our UI allows the user to, to size teams down to 720 pixels wide. And so when you're thinking about all of these layouts, how is that content going to reformat? What columns are going to be available? How is it going to respond when I, when I really scrunch it down? Grids, um, I just discourage people from using the grid, these big card views, unless they've got sort of 10 or less items. This is more of an exploratory UI than a discoverable, uh, than a, uh, a, 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 a disambiguation UI. So in a disambiguation UI, I'm, I want to choose between A and D. Finding you know, A and E, which would be farther down the, lot, down the screen, is uh, very difficult on our grid. All right, um, make sure that your integrations have a default state so you can quickly configure them and get them going. Deep linking is possible. I, most of you know that, but it's, use, it's worth calling out. Um, if, you install a, if a tab is installed, you have access to the roster. Um, and on top of that, it will bring along for the ride uh, a bot. So if you want to run a bot notification, one of the things that you can do is deep link to the tab that's actually in the, in the, in the team. That what that really, one of the things that I actually like in that, in that scenario is um, using a bot to notify into the tab chat. And now you're pulling that tab back into focus. It's not going to get lost in the, um, and sort of ultimately forgotten. So if a service is changing something where the entities are changing inside of the tab, um, being able to send some sort of a notification and post it at the tab chat is an excellent way of, of promoting your, your, your tab. All right, any questions on tabs? All right, here's the bots. I'm just gonna start off with bots are, Sort of hello world bots are the, the, I don't know if you guys have seen the video that I've done on this, but I do equate this with remodeling a kitchen. So building a bot is like remodeling a kitchen. Um, hello world is comes very quickly. Uh, it's super easy with the bot framework and we make it very easy for you to build. You take a sledgehammer to your kitchen and everything goes down. It's like, wow, this is going really fast. It's fantastic. Then the next problem is, is you've got, okay, well, let's build a few pieces, a few services. So you've got, uh, you, you start recognizing uh, some chat uh, entities in your, your bot and on the, in the kitchen, you push some, um, some cabinets into place and you, know, you're, you feel like you're making massive progress. And then about five o'clock, you get hungry. And so you push the stove into the, into the corner, you get a bucket of water to wash your dishes, and you can make dinner inside that kitchen, minimum viable product. Same is true, like you can get things done in a super simple bot, minimum viable product. The problem is, is that kitchen is not a place you wanna hang out in after, you know, for any length of time. And so it's not a minimum lovable product. The last 20% of that seems like of the kitchen, of getting a kitchen done, getting the cabinets uh, nailed down, having paint, getting the lighting done, you know, installing a pretty sink. All of that stuff seems like it takes about 80% of the time. So it is a lot of fine tuning. The same thing is true of a bot. To really make a, f a fantastic bot, there's a lot of fine tuning that is that makes it uh, that, that's very helpful to use. So the first thing that you want to do with a bot is tell the user what the value is of the spot. It is worth your time to interact with a machine because we can do these things, and you want to be relatively specific, like time off. Like these are words that I can use that uh, will trigger an action from the bot. Always, always, always have a tour that comes along with a bot. This is an opportunity to upsell and market the, the the full spectrum of what the services are. And you can talk about the entire app. So for instance, remember, it's not just a bot. It's a bot as one tool or one arrow in your quiver for your, your total app set. And so you can certainly talk in the tour about sharing things using message extensions and the value of tabs that are that come along for the ride with your app. So having an unauthenticated tour, uh, even better. So don't force someone to log in if there isn't a single sign-on. Uh, and frankly, if you're not using single sign-on, 
uh, moving forward, then we should have a, probably a deeper discussion because any speed bump that you put in the way of a user interacting with your service is another opportunity for them to bail. So um, this is a place where it's useful to have a designer. So hire it or find a friend or somebody's nephew that can actually do something simple and bold. Uh, the icons on these are so, so mission critical. I have seen actual submissions through our store where uh, the color icon is a long piece of text. And I got to tell you, like that looks awesome on mobile. It does not look awesome on mobile. Um, so having a bold avatar, something with high contrast is incredibly useful. So, uh, we use this hex, and this is the way to really have the conversation with your, with your customers is we want our users to know from 16 feet away that they're interacting with a machine and it sets their expectations as low as possible because for the most part, these are going to be very deep on one or two skills and not super broad. And so there's a little bit of forgiveness that can come along for that ride. Uh, a bot is capable of re returning responses with up to six buttons. Frankly, if you're returning up to six buttons, it means that you don't know what to, that the user needs at that point. Um, three seems like about the magic number. <laughs> Cards and graphics, I really strongly recommend cards. Um, it's a great way to get out of chatbot, um, this sort of chatbot vortex of never never completing a, uh, an entity. If you think about uh, um, multi-turn scenarios, so let's schedule a meeting with Michael. So I've got the bot on one hand, I almost want to do the senior census. So uh, I've got the bot and I say, hey bot, I want to schedule a meeting with Michael. Uh, what, uh, which Michael did you mean? Okay, great, here's a list of Michaels, uh, that Michael, Michael Forney. Okay, great, um, when would you like to have that meeting? Uh, one o'clock uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, fine, one o'clock tomorrow, he's not available one o'clock tomorrow, would you like to choose another? Okay, so this multi-turn experience can be solved with a card or it can be solved with an amazing invention, a form that is that has all the things that you have to populate. And so your bot responses, if the other downside of doing a, a chat bot only bot is that you are now stuck maintaining state and now the user, not only do you have to write a bunch of extra code to be able to do that, but the user has to do something that's in, it's incredibly unnatural. They have to say cancel, which doesn't occur to most people. <laughs> so. The next part of this is really about training. Fail with excellence. And there are recognized questions. These are the entities that you're listening for. There are recognized non-questions. Um, and so, and there are unrecognized questions. The recognized questions, if you're a task-focused bot, might be work item or task or to-do. Um, and really training all uh, for all those is incredibly useful. Recognized non-questions are equally as important. Hello, so can I show you the tour at that point? Or hello, here's, hi, here's what I do. Um, being able to have a reasonable response. When we did T-Bot, I don't know how many of you actually saw T-Bot, we've pulled that down because we built it on a different NLP stack, wanted to use something slightly different for our help. But it was a really good experiment for us. And we learned that people were saying thank you after they would get a, uh, a help uh, card. And our response was, I don't know what that means. Try searching for teams or channels. And, and it's just, you know, it would have been easy enough for us to say you're welcome or even to send something, send an emoji back. An unrecognized question is when the cat walks across your keyboard and hits enter. But you still, it's still useful to have something that's, that's an interesting uh, response for that. So when we're training, we're using Lewis. This is the natural language. Uh, this is our natural language processing layer. The, uh, the example that I give a lot is, you know, so I text a lot with my kid. She's 20 years old. Half the time I have to look up what she says. And this is actually, this actually makes a really good point. Like, here's all the different ways that I could say text, message, please. I message, please. I am. So all of these really mean send an S SMS. And this is not something you're just going to get looking it up in a dictionary or a thesaurus for a set of synonyms. It is incredibly helpful to ask your users, to ask the, the, the demographic how they would get this done. Um, it can be something that you just do conversationally and sort of jot, them down, jot it down, or you can actually send out a survey. Um, but 
differences in age, differences in the vertical, because we use different jargons in each vertical, differences in local jargon, frankly. So, you know, we're all over the world. And if you've got something that is really going to be specifically deployed in Germany, you may want to use German vernacular for that. Um, the personality for those responses makes a big difference. The personality is the brand, uh, in a, in a, especially in a chat-only bot. You can go to there. These are sort of the, this is a continuum. So no personality versus the class clown. We have actually, seen, I've seen one, one, <laughs> one app that pulled the class clown off really, really well. Um, I don't recommend it. It basically, it, it encourages users to sort of tease and test. Um, and you'll find that you're getting a lot of, you're serving a lot of queries that aren't actually getting anything done. The unflappable librarian is the one in the middle. And, and the example that I love for this is, um, I, so I used to work across the street from uh, a large public library and I was in the library and there was a, a homeless guy who was drunk and he asked the librarian, do you have any beer? Her response redirected him to the skills that she had in her task. She said, no, we don't have any beer, but we you can, might be able to find articles on beer in the periodical section, or you might be able to find a reference on beer in the 900 section, and you may even find fiction on beer in the fiction section. So she's taking something that she, that she can't, she, she could just say no, but what she actually did is say, in the, in the process of saying no was, here's what I do. Here's what this, ta what this, what I can accomplish for you. And so as we go through these recognized questions, just identifying, I found this, uh, being able to, to have these, uh, have a, a reasonable response for something and then redirect to uh, what the, what the actual skill is of the bot is incredibly useful. And it will move the, um, it will help you get to task completion much quicker. So notifications are uh, one of the most misunderstood and overused things I think we see in Teams. And it is, it's gotten to the point where I think there are lots of customers that are a little bit of fearful of this. Like, I don't want to get over notified. That is the fear. Um, so here's how you handle this. There are certain things where, yes, throwing this big bad toast is the right thing to do. This is uh, this is a moment for interrupting the user, and it had better be the right moment. There are lots more times, however, when there's been just lots of changes, and they happen over time, and we would like our users to get to them at some point. And so, so bundling those up and sending them as a digest as opposed to one at a time. And any of you, of you who are using the um, Azure DevOps, I was going to say VSO, the, the app formerly known as VSO. Um, so the Azure DevOps uh, connector, depending on how that connector is actually put together, it can be really, really noisy. And in our teams, there's a channel that's just dedicated to that. And nobody goes, you don't post in that channel because it's just, this is just a place for that bot. It's so noisy that you know, we're just going to let it let it be have its own place. So, what we do want is to have the have the bots have some meaningful posts, meaningful uh, posts into a channel. And a great way to deal with that is to post into a channel without sending the notification, and then at mentioning a user who is a member of that channel. Uh, and so now, I as a user get a clear text message instead of just a card. It's like app sent you a card, and we are working on fixing that. Um, that says, you know, there's something that's important for me. No one else gets that alert level. Everybody can see that something has changed. There's a card. There's now a, a, a threaded conversation that's happening inside of the channel. So that's a fantastic pattern to use when you've got something that you're posting into a channel and you have a targeted set of users or, or a single user that really you need to call their attention to it. So I love bundling notifications. I love using these kind of using a lot of the other controls like app mentioning to make uh, notifications much, much more powerful and direct. So don't forget that bots have tabs. This is so critical. Please, please, please. If you are working with somebody who is building a bot, make sure they're putting a tab or two or three. This is the feature that differentiates us from Slack. Just 
big pause on that. Like this is the feature. This is also the feature that allows people who don't want to interact with a machine to be able to have a browsable experience. It is also the feature that allows you to send much more summary, uh, summary level information into the bot conversation and redirect them as a direct link into this tab to finish something that re requires a lot more uh, of a UI space or a lot more information. So make sure that you're using tabs. I love seeing tabs, especially one that is a settings for the bot, um, because otherwise I have to configure a bot by having a chat with it. And there's no way for me to go and view what my settings are without asking it for settings. And this can be incredibly noisy uh, if you're trying to do this inside of a, um, inside of a channel. You can actually direct to from a channel notification to a known tab inside of a bot. I don't generally recommend that because you're literally grabbing the user by the shoulders, pulling them back, throwing them back into another environment. And that's just, I don't want that. I don't want somebody to do that to me, so don't do that to your users either. But um, redirecting to a channel is uh, to a, a tab, especially within that one-on-one -on -one bot experience, just that's it's a huge win and it would, you know, at one point we actually had a cowbell uh, that was like, you know, the more tabs and we would ring that uh, whenever we would see bots that didn't have tabs. All right, quick understanding of what bots are. They are not an agent. If you've got people that are trying to do agents, it usually ends in sadness and misery. Um, the problem is, is you have the issue of what do I do? And if your bot is doing way too many radically different things. I will clean your shirts and I will wash your car and I'll walk your dog and I will also let you set your time off. Um, that it's just too many disparate things and there's no connective tissue for people to like be able to understand what this bot actually does. Cortana has taken, it takes us so long to build out these, each one of these um, skills. That's the other factor of this is like doing a full on assistant. It's a lot of work. And it's something that you can put 18, 24 months into and still feel like you're not going to not, not gonna get a, a full product. Discouraging chit chat. So if you've got a whole bunch of snappy, funny responses, what you're going to end up with is a whole bunch of testing to find all the interesting responses. A little personality goes a long ways. Um, maintain the tone. So if you've got a writer who's like even somebody who likes to write, can write in uh, somebody's in the character. Have them write for the bot, um, and even put together a profile of who this bot is and the kinds of res the kinds of responses that they would give. If you must, because some of you will, there will be multi-turn interactions that you will do exclusively through chat. What I'm going to encourage you to do is let the user progress through uh, the way that they want to, and then use the bot as an opportunity to say, "Next time, try." doing it this way. So if you've got something that is a multi-parameter command set, uh, I can support, schedule a meeting with Michael, it's a Teams meeting for tomorrow at one o'clock. That's a, that's a big task, but if your bot can handle that, then fantastic. Um, but allow me to say schedule a meeting with Michael, which Michael, and then at the end of this, uh, use it as an educational experience. Any questions on bots before I go to message extensions? There was a question. Um, so this would allow a user to fast forward the conversation with the bot. Oh, yes. So the, the the this last note here. Whoops. This last note here is suggesting next time just do it the fast way. And so the, the nice thing about this is it's 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 like you know you're you're taking the user through a journey of understanding more and more options. Now the the other thing that I'm going to point out. Um, oh, and in terms, in regards to tabs for the bot, yes, uh, it also means that you can send something that's way smaller, just summary level stuff, and then complete that with, here's the whole article, right? So, and that's actually what we did with Tbot, was we would send enough information that you could probably get the task done, but if you wanted to read the whole article on that section, we just that the if you clicked on the card it navigated you off into the tab the help tab that had that section all right um, the one other thing i'm going to say about bots is once you have a bot it means that you don't have to re-up the service if you want to add additional skills that don't require changing the manifest 
So you can tell the user, hey, I've got new things that I can do. You can ask these things. If you have to change something that's in the bot start menu, um, you will have to re, uh, I believe you have to resubmit your manifest. But if you want to add additional services or add additional features, use the bot as a way to like let the user that, hey, there's some new things that are available. And I think that's totally fair. All right, um, message extensions. So this is probably the easiest thing for people to build, believe it or not. Um, it doesn't require you doing any custom HTML. It is simply sending data. And it just really, really, uh, I mean, it just manifests in so many different ways. So one of the PMs that's been working on this, Harish, I kind of kid him and say, you're doing kind of, an, you're doing a whole ecosystem inside of your ecosystem here. So let's just break down all the different parts of, of, and these are all just possibilities. You don't have to do them all. So you can have multiple tabs now for these guys, which I, I hope you're all aware of. And these don't have to come out of the same database. So these can query data silos that can't talk to each other. Um, once I select this, then this search box is now targeting uh, the, uh, uh, this, uh, this data set. It can also be a filter, which is fine. So, um, but I'm just going to say, like, you can have a bunch of these things in here. Don't put more than, I generally don't like to see more than four. That's just a lot. Um, the flow for this and my recommendation, and this is where, like, I really want to hold the line. All of these elements, when we do these, they are going to show me something that I can select from and put into my compose box. That is the pattern. Um, you can bypass that pattern, but I really, really, really don't recommend it. And the, how you would do that is to just have this new object. But still, even with new, I want that uh, object to get injected into the conversation and so I can share it. So the nice thing about this is, let's imagine that this was a set of work items. I could say new work item up here and open up a dialogue and just fill out a form very quickly. And now I've not only posted it back to the service, but I can now inject it into my compose box. And so this is a great way to have a list. The other thing I'm going to say that I, I, I do recommend, and it's a best practice is, gosh, have a default query. Don't make me try and figure out if that whole blank canvas syndrome. I don't know what to type here. It's just a big white box. So one of the things that we really, really encouraged the Azure DevOps guys to do was to track recents. And so if you actually go out to the Azure DevOps website and you're looking at a bunch of work items or bugs, you come back in here and act like you're going to send a message extension, and you should experiment with this on your own, you're going to see that the last thing that you clicked on in that website is the first thing that's actually going to be in this list. So the default query is really about the last thing I looked at. And if you think about it, the last thing I looked at is very likely going to be the first thing I'm probably going to want to share. Now, you can always get past that by typing something into the search box, but like this is this kind of comes to one of our core beliefs within especially within extensibility, but if you want to think about teams in general and just good UI, anticipating what the user's next action might be, but keeping the user in control. So, here's the here's the basic flow. If you're already not, if you're not aware of this, the first thing is I get this up, I get this list, I select from the list, I pop it in. Let's be clear about the kinds of things that are actually sitting in here. You have the ability to put in an adaptive card, which means that you can do post back directly to your service. So when we first did these, these were all navigational links. Now you can actually interact directly with a service. The, I strongly, strongly recommend that when we talk about talk to, to uh, people who are developing these, make these cards actionable. The information on that card should have enough that I should be able to take an action uh, if, if I understand the data. And this kind of comes back to having that conversation with your customers first before you try to start designing these. So if you say, what are the things that I need to have in the card? What are the actions that I would take? They will tell you, and you suddenly got a card that is fully actionable, has enough information to take that action, and now I've got this little tiny compact piece that is an entity that is represented in, in, in another service that's sitting inside of Teams. 
All right, keep them simple. You can do multiple parameters on these. I generally don't recommend it. It makes people freak out. Um, you can, if people, if you are working with folks, especially developers, uh, they will ask you, can I, you know, I hate having to click on stuff and the UI is like, you know, a little, for, it's for babies. I want to use text. You can just tell them, great, at mention this, at mention the thing, and you can do this entirely with, uh, with uh, text as well. So, um, and I do get that comment every now and again, um, but for the most part, our, our users are not that hyper-technical. Uh, so they seem to be able to get through these pretty easily. All right, cards. Card format, really easy. This is JSON. So all of our cards are JSON. Quick breakdown. This is called, we call this internally the envelope text title, subtitle image. Guess what? If you put anything in this envelope text that is actually actionable, no one will see it. <laughs> the human eye is is attracted to the area of highest contrast. And so that will always be this title. And if there's an image, it will always be the image. So usually it's the image that they see first and they'll come back and read the title. So just be aware that while you're, you know, when you're formatting these cards, there's some art to it. <laughs> Um, let's talk about the sort of bot framework cards. These are the easiest ones to play with. They are the simplest and they resist the most formatting. So uh, the hero card and the thumbnail card, we could have used exactly the same data in each one of these. Hero card is going to uh, center crop to a 16 by nine aspect ratio. And the thumbnail card is just gonna center crop to this square, I believe it's 60 by 60. Um, they uh, do support post back, they support IM back, and they support navigational links. Um, they're super simple and they render really, really well on mobile. Um, I, I do use them occasionally. For the most part, we're actually starting to shift away from them and move into the adaptive card world. On your left is the connector card. Avoid them if you can. Um, they're old and sad and tired. I mean, they're totally useful, and I don't want to like make I don't want to make the poor connector cards feel bad. But you know, we built them in for Exchange in I want to say 2008 because uh, I was there. <laughs> the uh, all that gray hair. Um, so they're the the only issue that I really have with these is is they come they don't manage width wise very well and they tend to render very poorly on the mobile client. So for most of these guys, when you're sending them, we're gonna transform them into an adaptive card to render them properly on the mobile clients anyway. So start with a, an adaptive card. And so the guy over on, this, on the right is the adaptive card. And if you haven't played around with these, go to adaptivecards.io. The best place to play around, and you can do these yourself, uh, with adaptive cards, just go to App Studio and in the card uh, editor and start building an adaptive card. And then send that adaptive card. So there's a little control that says send the adaptive card to yourself. It will send it to you in the desktop. And then you can pick up your mobile phone and look at the mobile phone and see how it's rendering. And for the most part, adaptive cards are going to render really well on the mobile phones. Um, this card is doing a show card action. So normally this gray spot that's down here, you wouldn't see it until the user actually clicks this notifications. And then here's a set of notifications. Now there's a couple of downsides on, on adaptive cards. And uh, I, we've been pestering that team hard enough that I think eventually we're going to get some motion, uh, some movement on it. So one is there really is no validation on this. You can have a field in an adaptive card that says phone number and the user can type hello and you are going to have to round trip validate that to the service and then refresh the card. Now, the good news is, is that if there's other data that they put in the fields, they've sent that to your service and you can send it right back to them. Um, and then you're going to render that card with an, uh, a new layout, which is it has the error message that's going to sit over the top of that field. So that's how we get around that. Um, for those of you that are playing around with adaptive cards, my team, my, des my designers actually design a bunch of these guys. And so we've got a small set of templates that I think are better than the ones that are on the adaptivecards.io. I'll let you make that decision. Um, and I'll share that with Dana um, so that you can share that with your customers and, and uh, um, uh, developers. Uh, 
man, if you have a sign-in card, this is all you get. And then, then we need to have a stronger cons discussion because, like, there are two places where you have, have to have a sign-in card. One is uh, there's a graph permissions, which hopefully you're not having to force the user as a big speed bump. But the second is you just aren't working in SSO. And so if you're not working in SSO, start working in SSO because it's just another, again, any speed bump that you're putting in the way of the user trying to interact with your uh, workflow is enough for them to just eject. So keep your users in flow, trying to avoid a bunch of speed bumps. So when we think about card collections, the one on the left, this carousel, I just, I'm going to point out that carousels are not a good, like, you know, here's five flights that you should, you can pick from. That's a terrible experience. Carousels are great for, they're a discoverable experience, an exploratory experience. <clears throat> so five foods you should be eating, blueberries, golly, what's coming next, broccoli, eh, you know, not such a fan, cauliflower, lots of cruciferous vegetables, like this is going nowhere. But you, you really have this problem of not knowing what was before and not knowing what's coming next. They're great for a tour. They're great for onboarding, frankly, uh, especially when people are pacing through an onboarding session. Um, these are really best, uh, and if you're going to do those tours again, like this is this carousel card is a good example of something you would do in a one-on-one. -on -one. If you're going to do a tour in a in a in a, uh, in a uh, channel, do not do this because then you know all 500 of us are going to click that button to take a tour, and now there are going to be 500 of exactly the same item stuck in this, unless you're targeting a specific message ID, which generally is difficult. Um, the digest, this is actually one of the few adaptive cards that I'm a fan of. Um, it's a great way to, it's probably the most succinct way to deliver a bunch of information. Um, this would be a, a fantastic thing that you could do for like uh, bundling notifications, frankly. Uh, if you want to experiment with the digest and just see how it's perform how it performs, um, the Bing News uh, connector is an excellent example. Um, there, and and you will see where we're reusing the Office UI to do the configuration, and uh, it doesn't really feel like our UI. That is something that we're trying to rationalize and figure out a way to have one consolidated um, uh, install and config experience. The guy on the left, we built for uh, the WhoBot, so that's a great place to experiment with this. Um, this is supports up to 15 items. It will scroll inside the card on desktop. Uh, in mobile, it will not scroll because that's just crazy. Uh, if you declare the image as a person, uh, it will be a circle because people are circles in our world. It supports up to three lines. I, of text, I generally discourage people from that. Like, if you can stick with two lines, I think it reads, it's much more legible. Um, but uh, it is a fantastic disambiguation experience. So, which Michael? Um, I do also recommend that for, if you have a set of results that is significantly larger than 15, that you indicate how many results are in the total response, show all, which I probably wouldn't do as yet another card. I would pop that up into a task module. I'll show you those in a second. But the um, the the I, you know the big issue is like if you're returning hundreds of items and you're going to show this card, ranking those items so that the things that are sitting on the top of this list are actually relevant is pretty important. Um, the last one is bubble merge, and it's not technically even a list card, uh, a list view, but it is in some ways. So if I were just to send uh, Dana like five messages, boom, 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 you would only see one avatar for Michael. And we eliminate all of this horizontal, uh, the or all this vertical space rather. And this is a hero card followed by two thumbnail cards. Uh, the thumbnail cards don't have an image um, declared. So again, and, and I love this as a fast and easy way to sort of communicate with users. Here's your best guess, go with the hero. Here are some other options, a couple of thumbnails. Um, they're relatively succinct and I, I like them. All right, here's the dealio. Uh, everybody, everybody who's building these wants to send lots of them and they wanna send them big. Everybody who's consuming these, so our users keep saying, wow, those cards are huge. 
So if you send a really huge card, we will now truncate that for you. And we've been doing that for a while. But just keep in mind um, that if the card is really, really tall, we're just going to truncate it. And that can result in some weirdness. So uh, we'll try and preserve the buttons, but we're going to cut out some of the middle. Um, if you send a ton of cards, you probably are going to have your app relegated to uh, its own channel and nobody will go and visit it and be its friend. Uh, that's the case right now with the uh, Azure DevOps connector until we uh, encourage them to fix that. Um, test it on mobile. Um, if you're doing more than three columns, your mobile experience may suffer. So there'll be some truncation, especially on um, on uh, adaptive cards. But again, use uh, App Studio as a way to test that. And it's you don't even have to bind it to a back end. So you can just do a quick layout, experiment with the kind of data that you would have in that, send it to yourself, and just validate. The big deal on this is checking the graphics. So um, if uh, you remember the graphic is a URL. And so if you're sending a gigantic graphic, I'm stuck downloading that on the mobile client. Like there isn't an optimi optimization for that. If you're working with a designer, you generally want to ask them for something that is a 2x graphic. And that means that it's just almost twice as big as it would be rendered. And that helps uh, render on these very, very high resolution screens that we have uh, in in play for the most part right now. Um, and then the last is, man, if you're going to put a text a text in a graphic, just stop. <laughs> no, you know that that's going to shrink down on mobile. It's going to get beaten up. Um, if, the t if there's text in that that is actionable, like it's just going to be really, really confusing. So, so just don't do that. It's a bad practice. It's not accessible. Um, and we should all know better. OK, any questions on cards before I go to task modules? There was one question uh, about any chance of adaptive cards ever coming to incoming webhooks. I thought they were supposed to be earlier in the year, but they never did. I know they're working on it. Um, I don't know what the time frame is. The um, uh, I can I'll follow up with uh, one of the PMs and get back to you on it. OK, and we can add that to the blog post so that everyone has that answer as well. We'll just put a little Q&A in there for the few questions that we've received so far. Okay. I will post this entire deck to the chat. Um, I encourage you not to publish it anywhere. Uh, but it is for your, if you're free to share it with your partners and anybody that's under NDA for sure. Yeah, I think what we can do is we'll post it on SlideShare and we'll provide a link to the deck in um, in the blog post as well as the video recording. Um, we'll put links to both of those in there so you can download it from that. Cool. All right. So task modules, uh, you can invoke these from two places. Uh, the you can so a bot card can invoke a task module, or a um, a tab can invoke a task module. This is basically using our um, dialogue uh, format, and so you're hosting uh, your content inside of our dialogue. Um, it's a semi-modal, and this is the this is the key. If I'm actually uh, remember that. I'm getting bombarded with like chats and notifications all the time if you're a super busy person. So while this is up, those are going to happen in the background. And so if my boss is like, hey, Michael, what's going on? Where is you know, where is this file? And I'm in the middle of a process that's sitting inside of one of these task modules. All I'm if I click outside of this, I'm going to dismiss this. So generally, I suggest that people use these as a sort of uh, it's a one to two minute time frame um, for for interaction. On the left, you can host an adaptive card. This is the cheapest way to do this. An adaptive card is going to respond to all of our themes. Um, it will resize itself. It will work on mobile. On the right is an iframe, and uh, pretty much you're on your own. So everything that is underneath this banner uh, on, on the top, you are responsible for making sure that it is theme compliant, that it resizes, that it works on mobile. And so there's a lot more heavy lifting, but it also gives you lots more control about what you want to have inside of this. And so if you need validation or a lookup, instead of doing the form on the left, you would do the, you would do uh, a hosted form that um, looks like the form on the left, but it is is a web page that you're hosting from your service. Use these in a channel, test them on mobile, um, especially if you're using HTML. Um, keep in mind these are for short interactions. 
they're really, really useful in a lot of different scenarios. And a task module can be invoked from a message extension plus, it can be invoked from a bot. Uh, you can use them um, just about anywhere. And they're, I just, I find them to be incredibly useful. I'll show you a, a, an example of that actually through a message action. So message actions are uh, where I send a chat message, or if I'm using the graph, I can actually spread out and ask for the information from multiple chats that are in the vicinity of the selection. And what I'm actually doing is sending message content to the service. If you're smart and tricky, then what you're actually doing is running that through NLP. And if you're using graph on top of that, now I'm sending here's the time of day, here's the persons, the people that we're talking about, and I can then pump that through NLP, recognize the entities and the intent, and then validate that with a, with a, with a uh, task module. Here's why this is cool. So if I've got a conversation with my friend Dana, hey, do you wanna go to lunch? Yeah, maybe 11 o'clock, where you wanna go? Uh, how about we go to the taco truck that's like down the street? Um, no, I don't want to go to the taco truck. How about we go to uh, Miller's Guild? If you come to Seattle and you eat meat, go to Miller's Guild. Great, we do that. So I send out Miller's Guild. I now have the context, and if I'm using graph, I have the context of it's my friend Dana, and maybe it's my friend Fred that's also in this conversation. 11 o'clock, which I can scan across these multiple uh, things. Taco truck, no. <laughs> Um, and you can then render something that is actually like, you know, here's a reservation for 11 o'clock. Is that what you meant? And that's the, like, if you're going to go down that path, always, always, always confirm with the user, here are the assumptions that we made, and here's the ways to get out of it. So in this case, we're sending message text directly into this text box but the user is in total control. Like if that's not the text that I wanted, I can completely type over this and delete the whole thing. I can allow them to select or I can automatically select something that's in a CRM contact. And if there are tags that come along for the ride, one missing piece in this UI would be make a new tag. But the nice thing about that is, let's say you got it wrong. At least it wasn't Vivek uh, Shamas that, that was uh, one of the tags. That's information that you can use that, that's clear. That's a clear telemetry back to your service that says you didn't get it right, and now you have the opportunity to do this complete loop of machine learning. So you can publish that back into your service and let your service know that you got it wrong. And if you see that that's happening multiple times, you can self-correct. So these have to have short names. That's the, the big thing. Um, use natural language processing. You can use them just to send clear text, like send this as a note, done. Right. Um, if you use the natural language processing, test it. But it's uh, and if you use that in combination with the graph, these are wicked powerful. All right, uh, activity feed. I'm going to go ahead and skip over because if you're not already getting notifications, you're not using Teams. Personal apps. The personal apps I recommend are tied to channel interactions. So use these in conjunction with things that are happening in channel, not as a standalone app. And there are two ways that you can do that. One is I'm using a bot as a sort of letter carrier to move things into channels that are closed to me. So I may have a question that I want to ask my HR team, but I don't have access to the entire team. And I ask the question of the bot, I fill in a form, and that goes into the HR team, and then it gets pushed back. As long as I have, uh, I also have meaningful tabs that come along for the ride with this, like here's where my benefits are, and here's where my policies are. Now there's a really good reason for me to have this even pinned to my left-hand rail. And that's the other thing is, IT pros can now pin these guys to their left rail, so they get our premium spot. The other way to think about this is all the channels pushing data directly into this. And so Planner is an example of that. And there are, are two ways that you can do this. So one is all the tasks that are assigned to me, I get one personal view, and I'm harvesting that from all these other channels. That means I don't have to go out and navigate to each one of the channels to look at all my tasks. That's a fantastic model. Here's the flip side is I have a bunch of people that work for me and they have tasks and they're in multiple channels and they're not assigned to me. And occasionally I go to those channels and I lurk. If you think about using the API for recent, uh, which is really easy to use, 
that now has a history of everywhere that I've gone. And now you can take advantage of that and use that as a quick navigational tool to like, here's the ones that you go to frequently. You may even be able to use that to do something interesting on your per on the, the, the just for me tab. Um, so that's the way I generally encourage people to think about personal apps, not just I'm going to make an app and it's just a personal app and it's not going to interact with the rest of teams. In other words, you're doing something for link. <laughs> It's not. It's just not the same. So, move away from the personal apps. Move into uh, that are just one on one. Move into personal apps that take advantage of team collaboration. All right, really fast. I'm going to show you what we're talking about. So, if I've got a tab conversation, here's the conversation. Remember that it's going to have a thread. Have this conversation with your users and the developers. Like moving these threads into the uh, recent activity, all you have to do is have a conversation. Your bot can do that, and people interacting can do that. Sharing a sales report, you should already know how to do this, but this is simply going through the message extension. Works like a charm, both on mobile and on, uh, on desktop. Submitting a social media post for approval. You're going to love this. I'm going to post. This is actually, uh, uh, I actually want to build this for us. Um, so I'm going to post. What I'm actually going to do is hold that post. It's going to be a submission to my PR department, which is a channel. And this is that notion of a personal app that is pushing data into a closed channel. And then the PR channel says, hey, this is the post I want to do. Everybody is in the channel. They can approve it or they can return it to me for edits. Like, no, you can't say that naughty word. Customizing your approval notifications. When I, I want to lean in on this, like especially with notifications, if you're notifying, it's a great opportunity to always have that set settings button, which then pops up the ability to have settings and say, no, this is not how I want to get my notifications. Don't be so noisy, or I need you to be a lot more noisy, or I need to be noisy about this one thing. So now you're letting users have control, and they actually are going to get the information that they want to, and you're going to get much stronger attached when you do that. This is that task flow. This is how uh, 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 Planner works. If you're not already showing this off, this is a great way to, to talk about the uh, sharing something from the, uh, the command box, a global interaction, converting a sales opportunity. And I'm going to fast forward to this one and I'm going to pause for a second. So this is actually something that we should be talking to with both customers and partners. Onboarding, if, a, if an app is onboarding our users, they are also onboarding people into Teams. Just let that sink in. Any app that does onboarding, you want to fund. So this is saying, I want to create a client team. I'm going to publish some information that we've been working on on the side, and we want to publish this to a bunch of external users and bring them into our team's environment so we can have a collaboration about the thing that we're sharing with them and that we're building for them. This is starting in a personal app. This is simply a task module. There is a direct one, oops, there is a direct one-to-one -one, uh silly there's a direct one-to-one -one mapping that we've that we've called out these managers are actually just team owners these associates are members and these guests our clients are guests selecting the files this is using graph and uh to, to publish files directly into the into a team template so if we combine this with a team template we all we have here are the apps that are supposed to come along for the ride if we have graph that comes along for the ride with that, here we can publish the files directly into the files directory. It, 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 we can have a SharePoint portal that is pinned directly to as a tab. And we can go one step further, which is we can add a welcome message. How many of you have been added to a team and you have no idea why? Wouldn't it be nice to land in the team and understand what it was that you were supposed to be doing? If you're bringing clients in, not having, you know, making sure that they see this first, here's what we're going to do. Here's the purpose of this team. This is incredibly powerful. This is a place to spend lots and lots of calories because I think it will move teams forward in a, in a very significant way. That is it. Uh, I want to thank you very much, especially for those of you who stayed late. And if you have any other questions, I'll be happy to answer them out of band. Okay, just a couple of quick questions while we're here to finish. Hey, can I deep link to these cards um, chat flow inside my mobile app? Uh, you're deep linking regardless. So the um, 
if so when you with it with the exception of the message extension so if a bot has published a card you have a message id and the message id is actually the target and that's why an adaptive card can actually be refreshed because we know what the card message id is and we're literally just updating the content of that card so yes you can actually deep link you can't deep link from desktop to mobile <laughs> Um, which would be really cool, but um, it's just right now it's sort of your app is simply sending messages and deep linking um, from one thing to another. Okay, other and there there was one more question um, a little bit ago. How many bots do you have at your Microsoft team? It sounds like it's best to create targeted bots. Uh, yeah, so definitely create targeted bots. I think right now, I don't actually know what the count is. It's more than 10. So a lot of these bots are simply they come along for the ride with an app and they're just used with they're being used as a notification mechanism. So Planner, for instance, actually has a bot, um, but you wouldn't think of it as a bot because you can't actually chat to it. It's simply uh, like I said, it's a letter carrier. Um, so I would I wouldn't worry about the bot as much as what the functionality of the bot is is doing. And that's kind of like if you go right up to the very beginning, it's like. Don't worry about the bot as a scenario. Like think about your scenario as a scenario. And then the bot just becomes transparent. Like the best UI is the one that you don't even notice. Anything else? I think that's it. Um, so there were a couple questions around the recording. We will be posting it through the blog post on our developer blog um, and we'll be tweeting out when that's available. It should be within 48 hours from now um so that would be sometime on thursday and um we look forward to seeing you next month cool and thanks thank for you, staying late everybody